I can't believe I have to follow the little kid. <laughs> and I don't mean Mark. <laughs> so uh, as Mark said, I'm Paul Marty. I'm here to talk to you today about museum technologies. Uh, before I do that, though, I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about Google. I assume many of you have seen this cartoon before. It's been making the rounds. Well, the caption is, life before Google. I got two little bunnies on the couch. One says, I just thought of something I'd like to know more about. And the other one says, that's a damn shame. <laughs> I like showing this cartoon in my classes as a library science professor. Uh, one, because it's funny. Two, because, well, it gives me a great opportunity to point out that uh, it was a librarian, Eugene Garfield, who laid the foundation for a lot of the conceptual work behind Google's algorithms. But three, because it's a great example of how quickly we can grow to rely upon particular technologies. You know, a piece of technology that didn't even exist 15 years ago, and we can't imagine life without it. And not just searching either, but think about all the other ways in which Google's making a difference. Um, the Japan crisis, obviously, rolling out their crisis response center within a matter of hours after the earthquake. Um, or Google Street View, who would go anywhere on a trip without looking things up on Google Maps or Google Images. Now, if you're sitting there wondering how I'm going to segue from Google back to museums, that's a picture of the museum that I helped design back in 1990. Speaking of museums, uh, oh, come on. <laughs> so my research area is uh, museum informatics. And what I look at are the interactions between people, information, and technology in museums. And uh, over the past 15 years, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of different researchers and professionals at museums from around the world, uh, real cutting edge people. And they work on really exciting, very innovative projects. Uh, unfortunately, some of these projects don't get too far out of the walls of the museum or outside of the museum conference circuit. So it was really exciting uh, just a few months ago when, and this is the real reason I started talking about Google, Google rolled out the Google Art Project. Anybody seen that show of hands? No, a few people here and there, right? Kind of a, you know, a really interesting project they put together. They work with a dozen of the world's most uh, famous museums. This is, this is the Met on Google Art. What they did is they took that Street View car and they drove it around in the museum. <laughs> but it's the same technology as the Street, as the street View car. You can, uh, the arrows don't show up on the screenshot, but if you, you can click on the floor to move around, you can turn left and right, you can zoom in on the paintings, you can get all sorts of information about the paintings, you can make collections of your own favorite stuff, you can do a tremendous amount of things. Um, but what's so amazing about this particular project is that it's just really one step in a long step of decades of museum technology work. On the left here, you have a copy of the very first proceedings from the Museum Computer Network Association from 1967, an association that celebrated its 40th anniversary at a conference in 2007. A great group of people doing very interesting work. What's intriguing when you look at the questions that a lot of these people ask the research areas is that they're often getting at this tension between the social world and the technologies that are involved. Um, the, there's a chapter in this particular, uh, this particular book by J.C.R. Licklider. Anybody know who Licklider was? Uh, BBN, one of the early inventors of a lot of the internet technology. If you don't know who he is, you might read the book uh, Where Wizards Stay Up Late. Um, and in this chapter, he sort of makes some predictions about where he thinks museum technologies are going to go over the next 40 years. And uh, as in the case with most of these predictions, no matter how smart you are, you're always wrong. What's interesting is that you're wrong, he was wrong in two very different directions. Uh, one, he very much over, over underestimated the technological changes, and he overestimated people's social abilities to cope with these particular changes. And that, and that tension has been driving a lot of the research as we look at what technologies are doing in the museum environment. And it raises a lot of challenging expectations, a lot of difficult questions. You know, people who walk into museums expect that the museum will work like a library, and they're often very uh, discouraged to find out that that oftentimes really isn't the case. And from the museum point of view, uh, a, a dangerous question often comes up, especially when they, they see things like that Google Art project, and they'll ask, well, if we put more and more of our stuff online, are people going to stop coming to our museum? I can't tell you the number of times that I have been asked that question, even still, even still today, despite the fact that there's a tremendous amount of data showing that it's the exact opposite, that the more information we have online, the more likely we are to attract people to go there. But still, it's a worry that persists, and it persists so much that I've even developed a, a really good pat response. Let me see if I can do it well for you here. Somebody says to me, um, are people going to stop coming to my museum if I put all this stuff online? 
I say, oh my, yeah, that's a real worry. Um, maybe you haven't heard, but ever since the state of Florida started putting pictures of beaches on their websites, nobody vacations in Florida anymore. <laughs> and sometimes it just goes, whoosh, and they're like, oh, that sounds really bad. <laughs> But these sorts of questions are important because they, uh, they encapsulate an important change in philosophy that's going on in the museum technology world right now. And this philosophy, if I can put on my, my library school professor hat for a minute, goes back about 40 years in the library science community when a lot of LAS researchers were starting to point out that if we really want to know what the role of the libraries in the community, we have to do a lot more than look at what books get checked out. You know, that we can't just look at the role of the user in the library. We need to look at the library and the life of the user, of the library's resources. That's a lot of a harder thing to do. But until you make that mental switch, a switch that, that many people are still doing in the museum field today, it's hard to get away from those questions. But once you switch away from what's the visitor doing in my museum to what impact am I having on the visitor's life, you see how these questions about what's going to happen with my visitation rate, et cetera, et cetera, start, uh, start going away. And this is a really important idea. When we talk about ideas worth spreading, you know, the idea that, uh, that all of these collections, that it's our history, it's our art, it's our culture. You know, what we do in the museum doesn't matter so much as what the role these institutions play in our everyday lives. And this is an astonishing conceptual leap for many people in the museum field. A community that barely 10 years ago said, you can't use our stuff, we're not providing access to our images. But well, now they're saying, hey, look, uh, we're uploading our stuff to Flickr. Do whatever you want with it. You know, use our stuff to make new stuff. Give new life to our data. My timer disappeared on me. Okay, good. Um, uh, this is... A profound change for a lot of people in the museum environment, and what, what it really shows is that introducing new technologies is a lot easier than understanding the social changes that come about when we introduce those technologies. Let me show you a couple of quick examples. Um, it's relatively easy to open the museum up. This is the collection browser for the Art Institute in Chicago. Chicago, yay. Um, all sorts of great things that you can see. Actually, not all that hard to do. Um, this is the uh, Louvre iPod app. Um, iPhone app, really nice little bit of technology. Again, not all that hard to do, uh, but uh, really fun to, to interact with. This is, uh, talk about augmented reality, this is a really great app. How many people have seen this app from the Museum of London? Uh, it's uh, worth downloading and playing with. Uh, what this, uh, how many people have played with Layer on their iPhone or any of these augmented reality apps? Yes, yeah, so you're familiar with the technology. As you walk around London, you hold up your phone and what it shows you is what London looked like, you know, 100 years ago, right? So it's absolutely amazing to see, to see, these, uh, to see these sorts of effects take place. As amazing as this is, though, and as tough as developing these new technologies are, it's really nothing compared to the difficulties that we face when we're trying to engage people in using these technologies. You know, what we want is for these technologies to be, to be transparent, to be seamless, to, uh, for the interface to go away, and for us not even to think about them. And this, this transition is very, very hard for people in museums. For years, the museum perspective was, it's, it's our stuff, right? If you want it, come and look at it, and you follow our rules. And the change now to, you take it, you do what you want with it, is a difficult one. I mentioned Flickr earlier. How many people here are familiar with the Flickr Commons project? Okay, a fair number. You know, a lot of museums added their stuff to the Flickr, Flickr's Commons project, in many ways hoping that by doing that, they would get more traffic back to the museums themselves. And that didn't happen. Uh, what happened was that a large number of people were using these resources that, that the museum still uploaded to Flickr. They got a lot more use out of their images, but it was within the boundaries of the Flickr community. And talk about these conceptual leaps, these ideas that have to happen. You have to be willing to say, that's okay. I'm happy that there are more people using my stuff, even if they aren't necessarily aware where the stuff is coming from. And that's not always an easy thing for people to uh, deal with. It's a tough trade-off, um, one that can be very, very difficult to grasp. Let me give you another example. This is a personal one. How many people have played with Google Goggles? Okay, a couple. This is, um, well, 
Right? You've probably seen scanners on the phone, right? You scan the barcode, get information, or QR codes, up pops a website, right? Well, what you can do with Google Goggles is you can hold up the screen and hold up the, uh, the phone to the screen um, to a work of art, say, like they're doing here in this, in this example. And up will pop information about this particular work of art. Uh, really an interesting way of interacting with art. And I was at a conference in October of last year, and uh, someone was talking about this, and I had, I had seen some stuff about it, but I hadn't yet downloaded and played with it, so I thought I would give it a try. And the person talking was saying, you know, this is, this is the future of people interacting with museum, with museum stuff. Well, so that evening, was the main conference reception for the conference. Um, the conference was in Austin, Texas, and the conference reception was held at the Blanton Museum of Art at UT. Beautiful museum. And there was on display in the museum a, a traveling exhibit of impressionistic masters from uh, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. Beautiful collection. So here we were wandering around this gallery drinking wine, eating cheese, and I said, you know, I really want to try out this piece of technology. I want to see how well it works. And I pulled out the phone, and I downloaded the application, and I'm holding it up, and I'm like, boom, Monet. Boom, Syrah, right? It was ex it, no trouble at all, right? It works great because Google's got thousands of these pictures, right? So it's no trouble at all for Google to match this. And soon I had a crowd of other museum IT folks, remember this was a museum computer conference, all surrounding me, all watching me do this, all ooing and aahing over how well this technology was working. And of course, you can imagine, this attracted the attention of the docents. Now, I should probably stop and say here that if any of them ever watched this talk, they did a super job. They were really nice. <laughs> they were really polite. They were really professional. They were also really young, and I don't think anybody had warned them that this was a crowd of museum IT people um, who were drinking and running around their gallery playing with new toys. <laughs> anyway, so uh, one of these um, uh, art students probably, came up to me and, and said, while well, I was showing off this technology, she said, excuse me, excuse me, sir, no pictures. I said, oh, that's okay, I'm not taking pictures. I, I'm just digitally scanning these works of art for image recognition purposes. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, okay, and she left. So we, we, we kept on what we were doing. Was, uh, out of the corner of my eye, I saw she had gone to talk over to a couple of the other docents that were over there, right? And they conferred for a little while, and then three of them that came over. <laughs> tapped me on the shoulder, like, excuse me, sir, but we think that's the same thing as taking a picture. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> You see, if I were taking the picture, the picture would be on my camera. But instead, I'm sending the picture to Google. And look, they already have a thousand of them. <laughs> and she said, well, that may be, but uh, we still think maybe it violates the terms of our agreement with the Walters Art Museum. And I said, well, you know, I don't really know about that. But see that guy all the way over there? That guy, he's the chief information officer from the Walters Art Museum. So why don't we go over and ask him? <laughs> which um, pretty much uh, effectively ended the, uh, the conversation. Well, we were done anyway, and we were very nice, and they were very nice. But the point is, is that it's pretty easy. It's a lot of hard work, but it's relatively easy to bring these technologies in. It's a lot harder to start thinking about what the impact they're going to have on the museum visitors, on the museum professionals, on the relationships, on legal issues, on copyright, on intellectual property. All these things start becoming challenging in ways that people haven't or don't necessarily think about when they're developing the technologies. And this, in large part, is because we're dealing with you know, what are known as disruptive technologies, or also known as disruptive innovations. And people are probably familiar with this, with this term. I remember the first time I came, came to terms with how disruptive, disruptive technologies really can be, uh, which was relatively late. I think it was 2003. It was when I first bought a TiVo. And, um, and then we hooked it up and we watched, I think, it, yeah, it was CSI Miami. Went to bed, came down the next day, turned on the TV, looked at the TV, and what had it done in the middle of the night? It had recorded a copy of Miami Vice. Because the only thing it knew about us was that we liked crime shows set in Miami. <laughs> and, 
you know, you look at something like that and you say, this is going to totally change the way I interact with my world, with my information space. Uh, we look at mobile computing, we look at social media, we look at the way these technologies are being introduced in the museums, and we see the same kind of disruption happening there. And from the museum perspective, and also from, from a library science perspective, what a lot of these disruptive technologies have in common is that they're changing the way we interact with information that we no longer are dealing with a centralization of information, but rather decentralized information sources, where the information we want is out there, we get it when we need it, distributed knowledge building, distributed annotation. And this is a challenging thing for museums to deal with. But dealing with this challenge is really moving museums forward. And what I want to close with is sort of a, a vision, a, a personal vision, uh, if you will, of, of the future of the past, of where we're going. You know, imagine yourself walking down the street in Amsterdam. And we talked about augmented reality already. You know? you, you're looking around, you're seeing what's going on, your phone chirps, there on the phone you've got a picture of the intersection, where you're standing, but it's how the intersection looked 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And there's a statue that used to be at this intersection, it's not here anymore, it's now at the Met. You can look on your phone to see what this intersection looked like there when the statue was there. You can click on the statue to pull up the information from the Met, access its records, see what you want to do, and, and move from there. This is a world in which a lot of really hardworking people in the museum community are working us toward. It's not easy to get there. There's a lot of background work that has to be done. But for years, we've been talking about the museum without walls and the shift, I'm sorry, the focus for all of that has been on the museum reaching out. You know, so if the walls go away, and we reach out to the visitor out there. But the important shift that's happening now, and this is sort of the big idea I wanted to leave you with, is that this whole process is being reversed. So that now, people outside the museum are reaching back in. Uh, we're saying, it's my stuff. It's my collection, it's my history, it's my culture, and I want it when I want it, where I want it. And this is a way of interacting with the world that is gonna radically change our interactions with museums, our collections, and I can't wait to see you all there in the future. Thank you very much.